I'd like to welcome you to Harvard Bookstore for tonight's event with Annalie Newitz and Seth Manukin, who are joining us to discuss Newitz's book, Scatter, Adapt, and Remember, How Humans Will Survive a Mass Extinction. I want to start off by saying that it is an incredible honor to be up here with Annalie. Um, this is uh, um, a really astounding book for reasons that we'll talk about. But when I first heard that she was writing it and when she explained what it was about, um, I thought, wow, I do not want to read that book. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then when I did, uh, I was really overwhelmed by the ability she had to take a number of different subjects and fuse them together in a completely original way. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I want to start with um, the fact that one of the things that really struck me about the book is that you combined um, really hardcore science, and you did a lot of research for this, with um, a very speculative view of the future, speculative based on research also, but one doesn't see um, those two uh, themes connected all that often. What, what made you decide to do that? Well, I think it was partly because um, it, it got a little out of control and I decided I needed to talk about uh, 3.5 billion years of history, um, and but uh, including a million years into the future. Uh, but also, I mean, the book really did take its inspiration from science fiction in some ways. And I've told many people this, but my, my real early germ of this idea came from the fact that I love movies about giant monsters destroying the world. And I, I wanted to, you know, a, as you do, if you write about science and think about science a lot, you think, well, what would be the scientific equivalent of this fantasy? You know, what, what would be something that uh, is plausible that could have the same destructive impact as Godzilla? Um, and uh, actually, I mean, the, a mass extinction is much worse than anything Godzilla ever does. So, so this is, this thus, is actually, far. More, thus far. It's, we haven't seen the new film yet, so right. we don't know what's going to happen. But, <laughs> um, but I, I really, I wanted to bring that sense of speculation that you get in a disaster film, an imaginative disaster film, and turn it on its head and basically say, look, mass extinctions are, as it turns out, basically the worst thing that can ever happen to the planet Earth. It's a moment when 75% or more of all species on the planet die out in a relatively short period of time geologically, which is about a million years. Um, but I, I wanted to remind people that there is a, a hope in, in coming out of these events, that it's not an apocalypse, and that we can actually not only have other creatures survive these events, but we need to be thinking really hard about how we would survive them and how instead of having an apocalypse, we could be planning for a future where we don't have an apocalypse or where if there is an incredible disaster, we have prepared for it. We have the means, we've used science, we've used engineering to think about those problems before they happen. And that's certainly what science fiction does so well, is think about problems before they happen or problems that may never happen. But I think we're at this impasse now with our science culture, especially in the United States, where we're not, we're not using the science that actually exists and the engineering that actually exists to think about these hard problems that are very real, problems of disasters, um, whether those are caused by humans or caused by you know, asteroids from space. So, so um, now that you've spoken about the future, I want to immediately go to the opposite side of the book um, and talk about the, the first section you have here is, is, you call it a history of mass extinctions. Um, and uh, when I was reading that section, I, I had a hard time putting it down. Um, and I realized that it was almost because I got some of the sense that you get in reading a thriller or watching a Godzilla movie, um, because you very succinctly describe these horrendous events that I don't need to worry about because they happened hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, but there's an but they will happen again. Right, yes. <laughs> but hopefully that will be at least 50 years in the future. So. Um, uh, <laughs> the um, uh, there's there's you know in in a relatively brief amount of time you cover an enormous amount of ground. Um, what was the research that was necessitated in putting that together? And did you find that process to be um, 
fun and as fun as it was to read, or was that incredibly difficult, boiling down sort of all of the Earth's history into 40 pages? Um, it was actually really fun. It was probably the most research intensive part of the book because before I started working on it, I hadn't done a lot of um, reading about geology. I'd always been a fan of geology, but I didn't really, it was something that I really had to educate myself about. So part of it was actually reading scientific papers and you know reading introductory texts a lot of the time and then finding scientists who were willing to sit down with me and maybe take two hours to explain stuff that um, you know that was to them somewhat basic and then taking me up into you know really current um, sophisticated stuff um, but I got to meet uh, incredible interesting people who study mass extinction like that's their whole job is they just think about mass death all the time like every day and uh, visit these amazing labs where people you know vaporize rocks with lasers and you know in order to figure out how old they are and figure out um, you know when certain events have happened in Earth's history and it was it was really it's funny because you'd think that would be the most horrific part of the book is reading about all these animals dying out and all these ecosystems that were incredibly beautiful amazing ecosystems that are just dead sorry they're gone um, you know there were actually a whole there was a whole other kind of coral reef that used to exist on earth which sorry dead um, because ocean acidification has happened before and it killed coral before uh, coral reefs before um, but Actually, it was that it was when I was researching that section that I started to have hope because people kept reminding me, well, you know, these animals survived and these other animals survived and actually these guys survived too. And so I realized that the pattern is as much a pattern of survival as it is a pattern of extinction. And and so within that, were did, were you able to identify patterns um, among the animals that survived? I mean, were there any commonalities between what made it through these these multiple mass extinctions? Absolutely. I mean, and that's the title of the book is sort of taken from from that. Um, scattering and adapting are really good strategies. And by scattering, I literally mean, you know, run away, like in Monty Python. Um, if there's something, if there's a mega volcano, go the other direction. Um, or if there's, you know, really bad predators somewhere, like take off. Um, so, so the animals that did survive um, and the life that survived was life that was very adaptable. And it isn't just about running away, of course. It's about once you get there to a new place, being able to survive in that new ecosystem and that new environment. And a big part of that is just being able to eat anything. So a lot of, like one of my favorite survivor animals is Lystrosaurus, uh, which is a synapsid, which is kind of a mammal-like reptile who survived uh, the worst mass extinction, 250 million years Can you ago. explain what a mammal-like reptile is? Basically, before we had mammals, these were reptiles that were had some mammal-like characteristics. And um, this, this particular uh, synapsid kind of looks a little bit like a pig. There's actually a picture of it uh, in the book. A little bit like a pig, a little bit like a lizard. has kind of a wiggly tail and a snout, and it was a burrowing animal. So we know that, um, that it possibly endured this terrible extinction partly because it already knew how to live in these really dirty environments um, outside of, of the air. Um, but the thing about Lystrosaurus was, in fact, after the Permian mass extinction um, 250 million years ago, uh, which was caused by mega volcanoes, which we could talk about forever because they're awesome. Um, uh, it was really one of the only land animals to survive and it did it by speciating, by spreading out across the continent and by like I said, eating anything. And it's very much like what humans do. I mean, humans can live almost anywhere. We can eat garbage, um, and we even like it. Um, and it's it's something that we share in common with these really ancient creatures um, that did survive. Thank, oh, blue ones. Um, yeah, have some garbage, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I'll probably just, I'll be surviving the next mass extinction with that. Um, so, so I, it, it, that, that was, that's the kind of animal that tends to survive. It's a human-like animal that is able to adapt to many different environments, eat many different things, um, 
And, but of course, unlike these other animals in history that have survived um, by being so adaptable, you know, humans have some other tools that we can use as well, like say, you know, looking at um, history through the lens of science and learning from, from the past and things like that. So, so we actually have an extra tool that probably Lystrosaurus didn't have. We don't know for sure. Lystrosaurus may have, may have had amazing literature and poetry. <laughs> it's been lost. <laughs> um, uh, or as yet not discovered. As, uh, yes, as yet undiscovered, <laughs> not yet observed. So when you, when you talk about um, both the past and when you talk about the future, it's easy to see why someone um, so in love with science fiction uh, was able to get so engrossed in the topics here. Um, did you ever find, and I know uh, you have, you've you been writing about science also for, for years and years and years, did you find ever in your conversations with scientists um, that they said, well, what, you know, you write about science fiction. What, why should I spend my time talking to you? That never happened, actually. All right. <laughs> um, Next question. Yeah, no, I mean, it. I actually, like, the thing that's been a pleasure about my job is that I find that many scientists either are secretly or openly science fiction fans. Um, and, you know, sometimes they really are kind of on the down low about it. Um, but usually... You know, the people who were willing to talk to me already knew I was going to be asking them kind of weird questions, and so they were like, "All right, let's talk about what would happen in a million years." You know, so they they were they were already ready. Right. Um, so after uh, after that first section um, of mass extinction, this the the second section was actually what I found most difficult. That we almost didn't make it. Um, in the same way that sometimes when I think about events from my past, I get retroactively scared. Um, the, 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 the extent to which uh, all of this was almost not here, I did find kind of terrifying. What was your reaction? Well, first, I guess, did you know about all of those incidents previous to working on the book? And what was your reaction in learning and writing about them? Um, I didn't. Um, there are several events early in human evolution um, where it appears, based on um, population genetics, and a lot of this is simulation, so we don't know for sure, but it appears that the human population did crash um, at one point, uh, possibly about 90,000 years ago, between 90 and 70,000 years ago. Um, and, and if it did crash, it crashed to a, a really small, small size. Um, like on the order of um, you know tens of thousands of individuals. There's many ways of interpreting that data, which I won't go into here. Um, it's also possible that other things were going on too. But the point is, it was a really rough time, uh, and and humans were struggling to make it. And worse than the 80s. Worse, possibly than the 80s, in ter just from a population perspective. Right. Um, not maybe from a music perspective, because we don't know. But. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, we don't know what kind of music they had 70, you know, 70,000 years ago. I don't know. Old wave. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I think the thing that was most upsetting was in, in that section, I also, I don't just talk about sort of early humans and, and the tough time that Homo sapiens had evolving, but also things that have happened more recently, like famines and plagues that we've had to go through, you know, within recorded history. Um, and I think that was the part that was hardest, was having to learn about times that um, humans have deliberately starved each other, um, particularly because um, it turns out that the UN doesn't actually look at famine as a war crime, um, even though it's done mostly in war. Um, and it's actually it's really effective, by the way. If you ever become a dictator, um, famine is a really good way to. Is, that, is, is your, is your how-to book for yeah, dictators my next book, the next? Yeah. <laughs> how-to. Famine uh, is usually a precursor to a uh, pandemic. So you kind of you get them with the starvation, and then you cap them off with the disease. Um, so it's uh, it was really, that was like the most Upsetting. horrific and depressing part. So um, yeah, and it, it was all, a lot of it was new information to me. So yeah, so humans are really good at, at, at screwing themselves over. And that's part of what I think we have to deal with um, as we face the future. And part of the reason why we're so seduced by the apocalyptic story of like, all right, we're just, we're all fucked and that's it. And, and maybe that's good, you know, I think a lot of people really feel that way, that like maybe we just deserve it. Um, and so it's, and it's hard when you think about all these times that we've almost destroyed ourselves to, to think that we deserve to live. And, um, but it turns out that it doesn't really matter if you think we deserve to live because at bottom, we're animals and animals are always gonna fight to survive no matter what. And if you strip away all that other stuff, I think we are gonna fight to, to survive even if maybe we're 
bad and naughty sometimes. So I think given that, we should plan to have a nicer future, given that we're going to fight to survive no matter what. Let's make sure that those survivors, you know, um, are living in style instead of in caves. So that, that segues nicely into um, the, some of the reactions you've had to the book. And it segues so nicely that I'm not going to use it as a segue, <laughs> uh, because I, I, I do want to make sure we talk about the, um, the future parts of it. Um, one of the, and, and a, a, a large, more than half of the book, is that right, is based on things we can learn or things we should know about the future. Yeah. Um, the, the section, how to build a death-proof city, was, uh, was um, I found fascinating because you speak of a city almost as a living organism with its own metabolism and um, uh, how did you arrive at that conclusion? I mean that was really, I mean basically what I did in, the, in this, this chunk of the book on the future was I wanted to look at the near future which to me is like the next hundred years um, and then look at the far future which is like the next million years um, all of which sound very distant but uh, if you're looking at a sort of species lifespan, those are, are pretty close and far. And in the near future, it just is, if you look at statistics on where humans live right now, um, most humans on the planet live in cities, and the UN is currently predicting that um, you know, more and more people will be living in cities over the next uh, 100 years. And so I, that was my first tip, was I was like, all right, I need to focus on cities. If we're going to focus on human survival, we have to figure out how to fix cities. Um, and the other piece of that is there's so much interesting work being done now um, that I call on in this book in everything from sustainable urban design to synthetic biology that are all starting to come together um, in different projects, architectural projects, projects in laboratories where people are designing new biological materials to build from, and if we want to have cities that last for a long time that are sustainable for humans, um, we do have to be thinking about how do you build a city that behaves like the environment around it. Because right now, the model for a city has been build something that is kind of at odds with its environment. You know, take a river and build a viaduct. Take a river that's twisty and build a viaduct that's straight. Um, that turns out to not be a good idea. Um, and a lot of cities are actually rectifying that right now and building kind of curvy viaducts, but that's just the beginning. What ultimately the goal would have to be is to have, again, as many people as possible in these cities that are essentially functioning like living organisms that are carbon neutral, um, that may be in a very futuristic register built out of semi-living materials. So you might have things like cyanobacteria, which are really great photosynthesizing organisms, doing things like water filtration, or modified to do things like provide light. Um, I talked to one uh, synthetic biology designer who said, you know, historically we've tried to kill all the mold in our homes, and maybe what we should be doing is welcoming the mold in and modifying it to perform functions within our homes. And so that in the future we might be cultivating mold and you might go to your neighbor and say like, you know, you've got some really good mold. Could I you know, borrow it, start growing it myself? Um, and maybe we'd be cooking up our own in energy as well. Like maybe we would be growing uh, biofuel in our homes. And so again, that's a very futuristic scenario. Um, but at the same time, I think it's, if you're thinking about how do you make a survivable city, it has to be something that's heading in that direction, more sustainable, uh, built out of more living materials, and um, something that allows e human development to look a lot like its own eco the ecosystem around it. So every city might have its own type of ecosystem. And, and while that ha having mold in our house um, does sound very futuristic and yucky, <laughs> um, uh, you, you are you are seeing already, um, you know things that could be instituted in, in the very near future, like yeah. next year in terms of um, things like oyster beds being used to help protect a city from, from, uh, from flooding. And um, do you see that catching on, that, that way of looking at a city as a kind of organic thing catching on in this country in the near future? I think there's a lot of difficulties um, in this country in the near future um, because it's 
the, all of this stuff involves policy and politics. We're so good at political discourse, though. I know we're so <laughs> we're so good at welcoming science into the way we make our, our political decisions. Um, so it's like, yeah, I mean, someone first, start weeping over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's funny because when I when I was in Australia talking about this book, everybody was like, "Well, duh." Um, of course, that's what we're going to do. Um, I don't know if that, anyone actually said duh, but um, that was more of an American slang term. But um, they, they it, it, there's a much more welcoming environment for this stuff um, in, in other countries. In Scandinavia, for example, the same thing. There's a lot of um, you know talk about how we have to have organic cities. So I think it will happen in the United States. And I think, I mean, weirdly, like the, the Department of Energy is kind of sneakily becoming right. the new like environmental agency. Agency, which is really weird. I mean, they're funneling. I, I want funneling. I mean, they're actually they're openly giving a lot of money to alternative energy projects um, that are doing things like artificial photosynthesis, which is about creating and solar even, fuel. Even defense in some instances, because they yeah. view it as a security issue. They exactly and food security is like if you can talk about food security, then you can kind of get people talking about sustainability. Um, you can again sneak in through the back door, um, but it's just like it's a matter of not using words like environmental or right. you know, don't use the word ecosystem, um, you know, talk about, like I said, talk about food security, talk about energy security, um, and then you start getting the ball rolling uh, with Americans. So I think it'll happen. Security, not sustainability. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the reasons why I like, in this book, I use the term survivable a lot or cities to survive in because I think that um, thinking in those terms that we, we need to build places that will help us survive kind of calls on people's best instincts. You know, and they and right. it, it takes you out of politics into just how can I live and how can I make sure you know my kids and my cats have food and things like that. So, so um, there's there's been an enormous amount of very positive reaction to the book. Um, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about some of the uh, negative and very emotional reaction <laughs> it's received, um, specifically. Uh, from people who seem to have a problem with the combination of your being environmentally conscious and looking into the future. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I think, I mean, part of, I mean, there's sort of two reactions that I've gotten um, from people who are, are concerned, shall we say, um, about the arguments that I make in this book. And I think one is, kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning, where we really love these apocalyptic scenarios. And we really um, believe, I think a lot of people believe that the way humans are motivated is, is by being told something horrible is going to happen. And so if something horrible is happening, like say an entire species is polluting the planet and killing a bunch of animals and plants, um, that the way to help that species stop doing it is to tell them that they are bad and that they are going to die. Um, and instead, that's one. That's one that's mode one of thought. Mode of right. thought. And right. I think that in my book, what I wanted and what I wanted to do and what I succeeded in doing, I think, um, is talking about how we might survive and how our species might learn to function within its environment and not wreck its environment. And so I think that idea that we could have hope for the future and that we we could be building a better world um, is is hard because we are doing a lot of things wrong right now and so it's very hard for people to feel like well but if we're doing all these things wrong how can you promise us these beautiful green cities and like space colonies and stuff like that shouldn't you be telling people they're about to become cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers um, <laughs> chud for those of you who lived through the 80s um, and um, you know, it, you know, isn't that a better motivator? And I, I believe that a better motivator is to tell people, hey, you could actually build a better world. And you know, maybe the world won't be perfect that we build, but we should strive for that. We shouldn't be striving to think about how all the ways we might destroy things. You know, we can fix things. And I think that's part of the problem. And I think, you know, I think that was part of the disconnect. And I think the other thing is that. I advocate very strongly in this book that eventually humans need to go to space, right. uh, live in space, live off this really dangerous planet that's always blowing up and getting hit by space rocks and having ice ages that are uncontrollable. And you know, I think if our species is going to last long term, we are going to eventually have to live on other planets and perhaps Geo and you know perhaps geoengineer those planets, perhaps bioengineer our bodies to to live in other environments, and 
That idea is also really scary for a lot of environmentalists because it sounds like I'm saying, you know, screw the earth, let's go to space and mess everything up there too. And my belief is that we're not ever even going to make it to space if we screw the earth up. I think that the only way we're going to actually have viable ways of living in space is if we actually figure out how to deal with the environment on Earth first. We're going to have to learn how to manipulate ecosystems to make them more productive, um, to rescue them from damage, um, to remediate them. And that's the only way, speaking of environment, um, there's like an insect from an outside environment. Um, that that's really the only way we're going to make it to space is by figuring out these questions about how to use the environment and how to participate in the environment. And, um, and the reason why is, of course, we can't survive in space just in cans of rocket fuel. We actually need to eat food. We need um, other organisms to accompany us into space. We, there's this kind of idea that like we'll go into space and we'll have replicators. We won't need you know, <laughs> crops. We won't need animals. We won't need insects. We won't need soil. We won't need bacteria. But we are going to need all those things. I mean, unless we somehow do transcend our bodies, and um, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, so I think, you know, that's a big... Is Ray Kurzweil here? Uh, yeah, sorry, Ray. <laughs> sorry, Ray, there's going to still be biology in the future. Um, so I think that's, and, and that's really my belief, is that there's going to be a long period, perhaps of centuries, where we're really just dealing with um, how we live on Earth and how we, we, we exist within our ecosystems on Earth. And then maybe we will we'll go to space. Um, but again, it's a really hard thing for people to hear. Like, don't leave Earth behind for, you know, th don't screw the Earth. Um, and so I think that, that was the other, the other issue. But um, I am not saying that we're going to space tomorrow. And if I did say that, I would be an idiot, because we're totally not going <laughs> to space tomorrow unless you're a robot. In which case, awesome. Um, have fun on Europa. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's really, I think it's, it's going to be a matter of centuries, if not a millennium, before we really have a, a robust, you know, space-going culture. So. Um, I think uh, it's not just that there are uh, very few cities in the country where you can make a Ray Kurzweil joke and almost everyone will laugh, <laughs> but there are probably very few um, stores in the country where you can do that, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, and with that, why don't we open it up to all of you? So uh, the question was asked by a um, science writer and science fiction fan and practitioner as well. Semi? Okay. Um, uh, and she wanted you wanted to hear more about um, combining those two things in your in your work, about combining your love of science fiction with your um, very um, uh, impressive scholarship. Well, thank you. Um, so, I think that science fiction is a great inspiration, and I mean. As I mentioned earlier, scientists also take inspiration from science fiction too, um, whether they admit it or not. And I think that it can be very helpful in guiding you to questions that are interesting to a broad audience. Um, one of the things about great scientists is that they often focus very narrowly on one problem over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and, and thank goodness that they're doing that um, because that's helping to save the world. But for a science writer, we have to be thinking thinking about what people, you know, the, the larger context of that iterative process. And I think science fiction helps us see science in that context, a social context or a political context. And so, um, as I said, a lot of my inspiration for stories comes from that. And one of the things that's nice about science fiction is I think it's made me braver about asking really weird questions because I'm just used to everyone asking weird questions in the books that I'm reading. So it's, it, it seems seems less strange to me. Um, and I think uh, often that scientists are happy to be asked those questions, you know, because normally people aren't asking them things like, well, what, you know, when you start, uh, you know, genetically engineering people, what might you do? Actually, that's a bad example, because any science, no, yeah, I, I could right. not actually get a scientist to answer that question. It was kind of annoying. Um, because no, no one. But I mean, but you can ask, um, you know, really uh, speculative questions, and oftentimes, you know, it, you get a great answer. Um, the uh, the questioner works in um, environmental policy and yeah. education and policy on a national level, and um, uh, wants to know. Um, 
if there, if you know of any ways, or if you can think of effective ways to draw um, children into this conversation when at the moment we're having an exceedingly difficult time drawing most adults into it. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I do think that storytelling can be a good way to do it. Um, again, it's about placing stuff in context and saying, you know, for example, this is, I mean, you want to present them with facts. You don't want to just lie and and um, so and just tell stories. But I think there is something really fascinating about the story of how our planet behaves. Um, climate change, for example, isn't just something that humans have done. You know, it's something that's caused by volcanoes. For example, it's caused when that when that asteroid hit the planet and killed off most of the dinosaurs. That set off a period of catastrophic climate change, and that's really what killed off most of those animals at the time. And so. I think there's a, a bigger story about the drama of living on a planet that is incredibly fascinating and that can lead to kids having a better understanding of the fact that the planet they live on isn't static. It's, it's kind of like a, a really awesome giant machine, or, or a giant monster even, <laughs> um, and that it has different behaviors at different times, and that it changes and evolves, and that also allows you to think about the future too and to think about well why is you know what is the planet doing right now what's happening in the atmosphere what's happening in the oceans how might it change in the future maybe even introduce kids to some of the really awesome computer programs that people use to simulate uh, environmental changes which are awesome in fact there was a group of geologists at, at Stanford that just released um, a terrific uh, simulation of the climate on Westero on the Game of Thrones world, Westeros and Essos and all of the different uh, continents. And they used that software. They used climate simulation software and um, geo and software for simulating uh, sort of geographical regions, but used information from these fantasy books to talk about the real properties of that planet. And it was amazing and it taught, it really did have the potential to teach people what it means when you talk about a climate simulation because I think that is really confusing to people. Like, well, how, what do you mean you can predict what the climate will be in a hundred years? It's like, well, here's how you do it. You know, we take information and we put it in and we, we make extrapolations. So I do think that can be effective. And like I said, there's a lot of awesome machines and software that people use that's inherently interesting. So. So uh, the the question um, is that uh, the 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 questioner said that um, he found a lot of hope, a message of hope in the book. Um, and did you start out with your research um, uh, expecting to find that, or not? I I actually didn't, and I I did as I I, I said earlier. I I went into it because I really love disaster, and so I really had thought initially that this was this whole book was just going to be a chronicle of like disaster and ugliness and like fire from the sky and it was just going to be um, just all that. Disaster porn, right. but scientific. Um, yeah, and um, I, it really was exactly what you would hope would happen with a scientific process of evidence gathering and the more evidence I gathered, the more I was seeing these patterns of survival and and that they that they weren't just random, that there really were these patterns, that the kinds of animals that survived um, had shared characteristics and also the patterns in the disasters were, were all, they also had shared characteristics. All these, these mass extinctions are connected to climate change and habitat change. You know, they may start with like a giant fireball, but the, the really deadly part is when habitats change and animals no longer have food. And so so um, it really, as I, as I say at some point in the book, that my hope is not just some cheesy feeling that humans are awesome. It's actually founded on scientific evidence because we share the traits of a survivor species with all these other species. So I think we're going to make it. Um, but how? How fun that will be, I can't predict. <clears throat> so I think we have one, two, three more questions, and then that's probably all we have time for. Is okay. The the first part of the question was that IO9 is awesome and that we all love it. Uh, and the second part was 
um, uh, the questioner said that he um, believes in God and the God as he defines it um, is not mutually exclusive with science and what if any part do you see spirituality playing um, in the future? Is that the I mean, I think it absolutely can, right? I mean, there's no, as you point out, there's no reason why spirituality has to be in conflict with science. I think this is something that in the United States, we're particularly hot to believe that, um, that, that science and God have to hate each other. Um, I don't, there's many other spiritual traditions that don't think that. Um, and actually, as I was working on this book, um, I do think there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of faith that goes into believing in science and believing that we can save ourselves using tools that we build and using observation and, and learning from our environment. And so there is a kind of a leap of faith that happens there. And I also think, I mean, I actually have a chapter in this book where I talk about the book of Exodus, which is like my favorite book in the Bible. And I wish that there'd be an awesome movie, more awesome than the one that's coming up. Um, and I, I think that's a really instructive story uh, of survival. And I think one of the things that spirituality does, many spiritual traditions have awesome stories about survival. And Exodus is a story about, um, people forget this because I guess most people don't hang out with the Old Testament as much as they should. Um, but. It actually ends with, um, you know, it's the story where like the Jews escape from the Egyptians, not based on real history, but it's still a great story. And you know, there's like all the stuff that you've seen with the plagues and all the stuff that's really awesome. And then the Jews escape. Probably not so much for the Egyptians. No, well, but it was still a rain of blood. Right, I mean, right, come right. on, Impressive. it was cool. When awesome, I was a, awesome in the literal sense. Yeah, of the no, word. When it, but I mean, when I was a kid, like at Seder, I was always like, yeah, let's get to the rain of blood and frogs. You know, it's like the cool part. Um, also, you could like dip your finger in the wine. Yeah, I was like, yeah, let's get to the Afikomen. Yeah, so. well, no, that was good too. <laughs> I, I just wanted to get paid. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I, I liked the rain of blood more than getting paid, I guess, um, which is probably why I'm a science writer. So, um, I, I, but the the way that that book and ends, I'm an investment banker. <laughs> <laughs> So the way that Exodus ends is actually with um, the Jews hanging out in the desert and actually not knowing what's going to happen next. So they know they've survived this terrible thing. They've they've gone into this diaspora. They've scattered away from the danger um, and from the oppressors. And they're basically told by God, um, sorry guys, maybe your kids will make it to, to safe ground. But you're going to be basically in the desert. And I think that's a great lesson, a great story for people like us who are sitting here in the middle of history, knowing that things are really messed up and not knowing how it's going to turn out, and having to think about the fact that, well, maybe the future will be better. We have to do everything we can now in the present to try to make that future better, but we'll never know, because we're always going to be stuck here in the present, in our timeline. And I mean, this is a book about looking a million years into the future, and so you have to kind of be able to have that feeling of satisfaction knowing that maybe all the shit you're doing now won't pan out. You're just going to have to keep trying anyway. And so I don't, you know, I'm not a believer, but I'm a believer in that story. So. The questioner is a physiologist and uh, he thinks people will begin to appreciate um, the uh, situation we're getting them ourselves into when um, we realize the importance of CO2 and how central it is to breathing um, uh, and how water and CO2 and oxygen are, um, are, are sort of go hand in hand if we want to survive. Uh, and if the balance gets out of whack, we won't. Um, uh, and um, I guess from that, do you see any countries right now taking the politically necessary steps to work towards a future where there is not more and more CO2 in the, in, in, in the um, atmosphere and the environment all the time? I mean, I think any country that's investing in alternative energy that is carbon neutral um, or even carbon negative is taking that step. And I really hope we don't have to get to a point where people have to wear breathing masks all the time, like in various science fiction shows. Um, you know, I think that people are taking those steps. And, and like I said, sort of earlier, where I was talking about Exodus, there's that 
horrible feeling of we just don't know how it's going to turn out. I mean, right now in the United States, even in the United States, the Department of Energy is investing in a lot, investing a lot of money in scientific research into alternative fuels that will be carbon neutral. We don't know how that's going to turn out. We may not know in our lifetimes how that's going to turn out. There's certainly other countries like in Denmark and Sweden. I mean, they're way ahead of us in terms of their planning for alternative energy. They have fantastic uh, wind farms off the coast and are trying to switch over to things like you know using as much as possible uh, non-fossil fuels. Um, you have places like uh, you know Minnesota. Just um, their uh, government. I think it was Minnesota and not just Minneapolis, voted to plan to switch over to solar in the future rather than invest in solar infrastructure rather than in uh, traditional fossil fuel infrastructure, which I think we don't know how that's going to pan out. I mean, it's just a kind of committee vote on how they would plan for their future of the way that they build their infrastructure. But that kind of little thing um, is a big deal. I mean, it's, it's about um, a region planning that the future will be based on this other kind of energy. And that's, I mean, planning for a new kind of infrastructure uh, is a big step. I mean, that's a big part of what's difficult is that we have this infrastructure now based on fossil fuels and switching over is expensive. And, and having ways of using that energy is expensive. Whole, you know, having containment for that, you know, how do, how do you store solar energy is still a really big question. Um, so I think there's a lot of glimmers of hope, but obviously there's no country you can point to and say like, wow, they're totally carbon neutral. Um, it just hasn't happened yet. We're still transitioning. Um, one thing I will say, I will add is that to put this in perspective, 50 years ago, we didn't even know about the carbon cycle. We didn't know that we could affect the carbon cycle. We didn't know that we were able to even cause a, a change in the environment of that nature. Um, we certainly knew about pollution, but we didn't understand that the planet has this carbon cycle and that it's going to continue, the climate will change in these really dramatic ways. And 50 years later, this is a huge political agenda, even in this country, um, to think about that issue. And so we have kind of come a long way in 50 years um, from not knowing shit about that to actually turning it into an international political issue. So sometimes Homo sapiens does okay, and maybe in 100 years we will be on a much, much better path than we appear to be right now. So um, <laughs> the question is that uh, the current era that we're, the current um, not, what, do you refer to that as a geological era or a? You could call it a period. A, a period. Yeah. Um, is um, the Anthropocene period. Um, and it has not been a good one for life. Uh, 10,000 years ago, you had um, enormous amounts of megafauna dying off. If we look 10,000 years in the future, uh, there's certainly the possibility of all sorts of non megafauna dying off. Um, so, how do you view the current mass extinction that's going on, um, where do you rank that in the all-time list of top ten mass extinctions? <laughs> so there's only been five mass extinctions so in the history So it's definitely the in the top ten. It's, it's definitely, could be, we don't know yet. Um, so there's two things. One is there have only been five because the general agreement uh, among um, geologists and environmental scientists is that a mass extinction is when 75 percent or more species die out over about a million to two million years. And that's a pretty hard definition. Like, that's that's the definition that we all... Not hard, difficult, use. like hard and fast. Hard and fast. That is, in geological... It's long in human time, but it's very fast in geological time. A couple million years is, is really intense. I mean, that's why we call them mass extinctions, because that's basically almost all life on Earth dying out over a very short period of time. And it usually takes several million years to recover from that, too, because the ecosystems are decimated, right? You've got all kinds of weird imbalances. Sometimes you've got way too many predators. Sometimes it's all slime mold. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, I talked to a guy who actually said, I study slime world, um, which was the <laughs> time, this was a sort of period after a, a mass extinction, um, which was good for slime. Um, so um, they, you know, right now, I, I actually think it's quite plausible that we are in the early days of a mass extinction. We don't have enough data yet. Um, it's very likely that the dying off of the megafauna could be the early part of that mass extinction. Um, 
there are extremely elevated levels of extinction among land animals right now. We don't know for sure about um, animals in the ocean, but you have to understand two things. One is there's always a background level of extinction. So what you look for, you know, there's always animals going extinct and speciating and things like that. So you look for these spikes, right, where you suddenly see elevated levels of extinction. We've had non-mass extinctions many times in the planet, like where say only 30% of species die out, or only animals on land die out. Um, animals yeah. in the ocean, yeah, whatever, land animals. Ocean animals are kind of more cool. Um, and, and so we, maybe we're in the early days of one of these non-mass extinctions. Um, the rate at which animals are, are going extinct is worrying because it's a very, they appear to be going extinct very rapidly. But again, um, we have to be cautious because uh, we don't have enough data yet and these things do take a long time. However, that said, I, I mean we should be cautious about characterizing whether it's a mass extinction. That said, it doesn't look good. Um, you know, elevated levels of extinction combined with climate change, those are two signals that we see in every other extinction event, mass or otherwise. So we really do need to be preparing now and thinking about all the things we've been talking about, building sustainably, cutting our dependence on fossil fuels, doing everything we can to prevent these climate and habitat changes, which lead to not necessarily a scenario where you can't breathe. Um, much more dangerous is actually what comes before that, where climate is changing slightly, and that changes habitats, and that means animals and plants die off, and you get starvation. And really, most of these mass extinctions, what you see is you see climate change and then mass starvation because plants die off, then the herbivores have nothing to eat, then the carnivores have nothing to eat, and slowly everybody is incredibly hungry. Um, and so that's going to happen sooner rather than later. And that's why, for example, a lot of environmentalists now are just worried about food security because what climate change really means is starving. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to be hot or you're going to get beachfront property if you live in um, Nunavut or whatever. Um, <laughs> although maybe that'll happen. But the point is that you're really, what you're going to see first are these, these massive um, famines and water shortages. Um, so, so my point is, it looks like things are bad enough that we do need to be preparing for the worst and be thinking about how to redirect civilization to not be messing up the environment and not to be um, changing habitats so that animals are going extinct. But we don't know for sure how bad the extinction is going to be. Right now, it's actually not that bad. I mean, I actually talked. Not the rate, the cumulative amount. The cumulative mean. amount is right. not that bad. I mean, compared to, I mean, it's, it's bad, but it's compared to other extinction events. You know, it, we're still, you know, a lot of these endangered animals are still not extinct. And so we're in a kind of a grace period where we can all sort of hold our breaths and you know say, oh, it's kind of fine. But if we don't start steering away from you know burning fossil fuels is one really easy thing that we can steer away from. Um, yeah, things are could get really bad. One of one of the guys I talked to who studied one of the uh, sort of paleo environmentalists that I talked to, um, he looks at. Uh, ancient um, uh, ecosystems and how they change uh, during mass extinctions. Um, this guy, Peter Rupnarine, and he does these great simulations and he said, you know, here's the thing is, maybe what happens is there's kind of a tipping point and once you reach a point where like 40% of your species die out, then it just shoots up really high. So it's not like it's incremental, like, oh, we get to 40% species dying out and then it's it just keeps exponential. creeping up. Yeah, it's suddenly it's like, oh, and then it's 70%. So there could be like a horrific environmental tipping point where, you know, everything seems like, well, we did kill off like 40% of the species on the planet, but we're doing okay. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we just don't know is how those work. So um, just to leave you feeling really happy <laughs> about the future. Um, but my point is that we have time. Like we do have time to change and we are slowly changing course. And I think to go back to my point about how we only discovered the carbon cycle about 50 years ago, you know, we've actually turned a lot in that 50 years. We've kind of swerved in a way that's fairly impressive, not always that 
heartening. But um, so I think if we can keep swerving, um, we may we may miss the horrible um, mass extinction. That's the hope. Um, well, I totally can't wait to see how this story ends. Um, <laughs> see you in a million years.